Hello, I'm Peter Carter. I'm making this video. This is a short video for the Climate Emergency Institute, and it is on that most important IPCC report just published this month, August 2021. The report for the IPCC sixth assessment, Working Group 1, which is the science. Uh, these are using uh, outreach uh, slide pack provided by the IPCC for outreach by authors. And as I say, this one is real short, just about 15 slides here. The first statement by the IPCC, recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid and intensifying and unprecedented in thousands of years. Uh, this is the single most important statement by this uh, report. Unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C will be out of reach. This would in all likelihood also apply to 2 degrees C, 2 degrees C that is by 2100. To limit warming, strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases are necessary. In this report, the IPC stressed that methane emissions have to be slashed on an immediate basis as well as carbon dioxide. And this would have another benefit. This would not only reduce the consequences of climate change but also improve air quality. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and making extreme climate events including heat waves, heavy rainfalls and droughts more frequent and more severe. Climate change is already affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways. The changes we experience will increase with further warming. There's no going back from some changes in the climate system. This shows human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that is unprecedented in at least the last 2,000 years. The temperature graph on the left here is the 2000 year record. A temperature increase, global temperature increase on the vertical axis, zero here, 1 degree C, 1.5 degree C, 2 degree C. This is today, that uh, sudden abrupt big global temperature increase. And in actual fact, the global temperature was cooling, so this is a sudden reverse into a global temperature increase and extremely rapid. On the right, is a uh, record and a computer model projection of global temperature increase from 1850 or pre-industrial. On the bottom here there's a, a computer projection in green and this shows the global temperature increase without the addition of human industrial greenhouse gases and as you see the trace is flat. Above is the uh, recorded global temperature increase here in black and uh, trailing it almost in lockstep is this light brown which is the computer model projection. So the temperature has increased up to about 1.1 degrees C in this report and the global temperature increase is obviously accelerating even quite recently. This is one of the IPCC's working group one methods of showing that we are already experiencing a big increase in extreme weather events. The text is, climate change is already affecting every inhabited region across the globe, with human influence contributing to many observed changes in weather and climate extremes. So these, uh, these, uh, these images represent uh, the land masses. I put a world map here for orientation. North America's here, South America there, Europe and into Asia there, this is Africa, Australia and New Zealand. First are hot extremes that are happening on land. All continents and almost all regions are being affected by these hot extremes. Next is heavy precipitation on land. Again all continents are being affected and Asia is most affected by the heavy precipitation rainfalls. On the bottom here uh, on the bottom here is a map that shows drought. It's a kind of intuitive that global surface temperature increase would 
increase the incidence of drought in the world, and this is the case. And drought, of course, is so important, and there's been uh, progress on recent research that I put um, drought as a separate image so uh, it can be seen in detail. And also, I've identified these regions and labeled them. I've identified them from the full re IPCC report. And the tan colors are increase in drought, and uh, green represents a decrease in drought. The following regions have been affected by drought. West North America, continuing in the Northern Hemisphere, West and Central Europe, the Mediterranean, West Central Asia, East Central Asia, and East Asia, Western Africa, and in the Southern Hemisphere, Northeast and South America, further in Africa, Western South Africa, and Eastern South Africa, and also Central Africa, and in Australia, Southern Australia, and the only region that has had a decrease in drought is Northern Australia. Now a very crucial finding with respect to our future from the IPCC Working Group 1. With every increment of global warming, changes get larger in regional mean temperature, precipitation, and soil moisture. I'm showing the uh, map of projected changes for global mean temperature, which of course is an increase, and for soil moisture change. For 1.5 degrees C projected from pre-industrial 1850 to 1900 on the left, and for 2 degrees C on the right. In the case of global mean temperature increase, of course, all regions are affected. The northern hemisphere warming faster than the southern hemisphere, the Arctic warming much the fastest of all, and that's at 1.5 degrees C. At 2 degrees C, the northern hemisphere you can see is uh, warming much more, has warmed much more than at 1.5 degrees C. There is a big difference between the shades of red there, and particularly dramatic, the increase of uh, Arctic temperature at 2 degrees C. Now, I put down here uh, clips of the northern hemisphere at 1.5 degrees C and at 2 degrees C, and the regional temperature increase, the regional warming uh, between them, so that you can see the very large regional temperature increases in the northern hemisphere and Arctic at 1.5 degrees C, and the huge increases in regional temperatures there at 2 degrees C. So on the bottom here we have change in soil moisture. Uh, the drier is the browner and the wetter is the uh, greener. Drying and to drought affects all continents. Most particularly and importantly you can see that uh, North America is uh, widely, widely affected up in from the United States and up into Canada. Continuing in the Northern Hemisphere, Western and Southern Europe affected by drying, and China affected by drying. This is Northern China, and that's Southern China. To the Southern Hemisphere, South America is severely affected by reduced soil moisture. All of uh, Brazil there going into uh, Argentina, which is uh, food producing regions, and that band there is Chile. Chile is in a mega drought. And you may be aware that uh, research has indicated that the southwestern United States is currently going into mega drought. Southern Africa, a very large region of Southern Africa, drying out at 1.5 degrees C. South Africa and also neighboring countries to the northeast and west are affected. And then finally to Australia. Australia's agricultural regions are in its southwest and southeast tips there. And in both those cases you see uh, affected by drying 
at 1.5 degrees C. So at 2 degrees C the drying regions are the same but the intensity of drying to drought is much worse. Shades of brown is much darker at 2 degrees C compared to 1.5 degrees C. Some regions uh, have increased and uh, a greatly increased amount of soil moisture and that would be a tendency to waterlogging and also a subject to flooding in those regions. So I'm showing just the worst case here and the best case scenarios here and the reason for this is firstly uh, clarity to be able to clearly see those two uh, trends, those two projections, but also only the best case scenario prevents a disastrous planet of frequent intense extreme events. So this is the one that we must, must get onto and that depends on immediate uh, rapid decline of emissions. Also, a current cumulative CO2 emissions is tracking the worst case. And uh, that's a paper published uh, entitled RCP 8.5 is tracking cumulative CO2 emissions. Furthermore, according to uh, current economic and energy policies, uh, this uh, worst case scenario uh, is going to uh, continue. So in the case of the worst case scenario, here we are at uh, 2020, accelerating global surface temperature increase, and this continues to accelerate uh, right up to the end of the century, and approaching 5 degrees C there. In the case of the best case scenario, uh, which depends on immediate decline and rapid decline of global emissions, the temperature increase uh, continues up to around mid-century plateauing, flattening out at mid-century, and then some slow decline up to the end of the, cen up to the, end of the century. Uh, this decline is uh, to a large extent dependent on the assumed successful removal of carbon dioxide. Next we have uh, Arctic summer sea ice. This is the minimum of a sea ice area at the end of September. And the scale here on the vertical is millions of square kilometers. Again, it starts at 1950 and goes to the end of the century. In fact, from 1950 up to uh, around 1970s, there was an increase in uh, September Arctic sea ice area. And then it switched to uh, a, a decline, an increasing rate of decline, up to where we are here in 2020. So with the worst case scenario, of course, this is the uh, maroon colored one. It continues to decline, decline, decline. You see this line here? Uh, this is practically ice free. And of course, the significance of being starting to be summer sea ice free is the feedback, the amplifying feedback, which is already operating of reduced summer sea ice, reducing the reflection of solar energy uh, away from the North Pole and away from the Northern Hemisphere, and that sea ice being replaced by dark open ocean, which absorbs heat radiation. So here is the best case scenario, dependent on immediate uh, reductions of global emissions, and this uh, flattens out around 2050 as a continuation of a loss of sea ice area flattening out in mid-century then staying around this level up to uh, 2100. Next is ocean acidification. Ocean acidification is measured by pH and that's hydrogen ion potential. pH is the inverse of acidity again up to 2100 and these are pH values and as pH decreases ocean acidification increases. Here's the best case scenario then for pH and the worst case. Uh, to make things clearer I've simply inverted that pH graph and this on the right here now shows you relative ocean surface acidity and you can see a continued acceleration 
of ocean acidification. It's accelerating already. An increase up to 2100 shown here in the worst case scenario. For the best case scenario, assuming and dependent on immediate global emissions decline, again the ocean acidification is slowed up but it continues again until around mid-century and only after mid-century does it go into a slow decline. We're now looking at sea level rise. Global mean sea level change relative to 1900 and again the record here starts 1950 goes to the end of the century and here is sea level rise in meters and here we are at 2020. Uh, sea level rise is accelerating presently and in the case of the worst case scenario of course it continues to accelerate. In the case of the best case scenario again depending on immediate rapid reduction of global emissions the rate of sea level rise slows somewhat but it continues to increase right to the end of the century. There's only a relative slowing of the established rate around, 2000, around 2070. You'll see there's some flattening out there. But even on the best case scenario, right from present 2020 up to 2070 or 80, it continues to steadily increase. This dotted line here, accelerating faster than the worst case scenario, is what the IPCC calls low likelihood high impact, including ice sheet instability. And the recent research indicates that this is going to occur, that the Greenland ice sheet is already showing uh, quite marked signs of instability and quite recently Antarctic research has shown indications of ice sheet instability. So I believe that we can expect if governments don't put global emissions into immediate and rapid decline that the world will follow this much faster acceleration of sea level rise. So that's the end of this short presentation and again a thank you from me for the IPCC Working Group 1.